Hi and welcome to the May edition of According to Pete. When we last left off, uh, I was working on my garage amplifier project and I needed to get uh, a higher voltage to run my fader motors. And actually I got really, really far this time, so I'm really excited to show you what I got done. I was going to get the 28 volt supply off of my beefy thing that I showed you before and I don't know the specs of it. Uh, I was gonna get uh, a little um, um, switcher converter board to switch that down, switch the 28 volts down to about mm, 10 to 8 volts, right? And I told you about the one that we have on the storefront. <laughs> Incidentally, that board's getting retired. <laughs> Oops. Upon reading the data sheet for this thing, I discovered, hey, I can't get um, 8 to 10 volts out of it. I can only get between 2 and 6, I think, was what it was able to do. So, like, oh, okay. So I'm basically doing all this work to get one more volt. We good times. Well, okay, you can look at it differently. I'm actually doing all of this work so that I can get these faders to move. The conversion um, uh, 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 equation is on the product page for this thing, so it's really easy to set it up. The only trick is figuring out which resistor it is. And so I went poking around in here, and you do the calculation to get six volts out for whatever ends up being, um, I, the, the, the value I calculated was like 6.9 ohm, 6.9K. Um, and of course, I, I don't have a 6.9K, so I found a 6800 and a 100. Um, and uh, basically, just to show you how this happens, if an uh, old prototyping thing, say this is a really big 0603 footprint seen as from the side. So basically, you take one resistor and you put it up like that with some tweezers and you have a little blob of solder down there first, you like that. And then you have the other one, which was the 100 ohm that goes down similar fashion like that. And then when you got these stuck, you just put the iron down with a little bit of solder and it fills that in. Um, and that's how you get your combined resistance for an 0603 package, which I hope you never have to do. But if you do, that's the way I do it. I set this up to uh, shoot for six volts. I ended up with about 5.9. Uh, tested the board independent of the entire contraption, right? Because you don't want to stick something in that you don't know what it's going to do. So I powered it up on benchtop power supply up to 28 volts, verified that I got mm, 5.9-ish, eh, close enough. So here's the bottom of the board. Just to give you an idea of what's been going on here. Um, and it may not appear that a lot has happened, but that's new. So that's pretty cool. Um, with my handy dandy pointing scissors, there's the resistor pack that I just did. So it used to be one, now it's two. And now I've got the switch set to five volts, which you can't see from under there. Um, and that gives me about 5.9 and a half ish volts out. And, and that seems to be enough to drive the faders. Now, I wired this up to the driver, which is under here, and you can't really see it. Um, and let's see, it's already hooked up to, under, on, on the other side of here, and I'm, I've sworn not to turn this board over, um, is the ProMega. And uh, it's already been wired up to the driver, because before when I was trying this was five volts and you know had to have something driving it. I hooked up the uh, uh, standby circuit for the amplifier. It happens to be CMOS compatible. So uh, you pull it high to 3.3 volts and it turns the audio on. And if you pull it low, it turns the audio off. And the cool thing about that is it does it without uh, pops or, or squeals or anything like that. That you know happens when you turn power off abruptly on an audio circuit. Uh, I turned it all on thinking, oh, I still have test code on the uh, Pro Mega. Well, it turns out I must have done something smart with that test code because I didn't have it anymore. So uh, since I had to write more code, I wired everything else up. I hooked the faders up. I wired the audio parts of the faders up to the amplifier. Um, yeah, so basically I was gonna go for broke. I had it all wired up, except for the 12 volts, right? Um, and I just wrote some simple code to test fader movement. Make sure that they're both working, right? Because I spent a whole bunch of time and money to make that uh, five volts into six volts. And uh, so I, I set up some new test code uh, on the ProMega. Uh, to actuate these and also to work the standby circuit just so I could make sure that it was doing what it was supposed to do, right? And let's see, what happened then? Something dramatic, I'm sure. No, the faders just worked. Um, and the standby circuit went up and went down and it was pretty uneventful, so hmm, it was really cool. Now, one of the things that, that sort of irritated me, but it's not really a surprise, is that 
one of the faders moves faster than the other fader. Well, of course it does. One of them worked at five volts and the other one didn't. So what do you think is going to happen? Just for the sample code, I just wanted to see them work. And what I noticed is that um, one of them moves faster than the other. Uh, and the other thing I noticed is that the reference that is, right, these are, these are actually two potentiometers in one unit, right? And I'm using one of those two sides to get a reference position so I can figure out from the control system where the fader's sitting, right? Well, if they're equal this way, they're not equal electrically, right? One actually sits up a little higher. And to be honest, who knows what's going on on the audio side? I've got no freaking idea. And what that's going to amount to is balance in the sound, right? But fortunately, I wired this thing up so that these guys are still in the circuit so that I can adjust the balance manually with these. Um, I could also do it in the code, and I may ultimately do that, um, but for now, it was just this. So I verified that, in fact, the faders do move and the standby circuit does work. So after that, uh, I set up a, uh, a little uh, text thing, so uh, like a little menu-driven system, so that I could adjust the volume over the UART, right? So I can plug this into my USB, right? I'm programming over USB. I can plug this in and use it as a USB port. Open up a terminal. Um, and basically, uh, as I was saying before, I set this up on a PWM so that it moves for three milliseconds, stops for 10 milliseconds, looks to see where it's at, and then if it's not below that, it'll adjust again. Um, now, when you set up something like that, you want to make sure that you don't inadvertently, you know, oh, I want to be right exactly on the number. So then you get to a place where the code is just doing this and it's never able to do it, get it right. So basically I just said, okay, if it goes over X value, stop. Um, and with a three millimeter, <laughs> three millimeter, three millisecond duration on the power, it's pretty easy to get pretty close. Um, in one of my test runs, I was shooting for, say, an ADC value of 750 out of 1023, right, 10-bit ADC. Um, and I would con you know, uh, consistently get like 751, 752. So it's pretty close. Um, and in, in subsequent testing, I haven't been able to determine any difference in the audio. So I think that's pretty good. Um, but anyway, I set up the UART uh, menu-driven system to just, um, you know, wanted a little bit of control. So I set it up to do volume up, volume down, right? Plus makes volume go up, minus makes volume go down, and uh, also audio channel on and off. Simple enough. That was zero and one, right? Zero turns it off, one turns it on. Um, and then I started testing it over that. And that ended up being pretty cool. Well, what's the next step? Well, the next step is to get the wireless working, right? And I had said and have been saying um, all along that I was gonna use like an XB and one of their internet gateways so that I could do it from my phone and like that. Um, but I'm not a patient guy, and I know that system is probably a pain to set up real easily. I know Michelle did a video on it, and it should be a lot easier, but it's like, uh, is there anything else I can do? Well, um, I went searching for um, a Bluetooth serial port protocol app on the Android marketplace. Um, free one, because I'm cheap. I'm not paying for it. And it turns out there's a lot. Um, I actually tried two, and I'll, I'll, I'll detail the use of, of that one in a bit, and you know, I'll tell you about the other one I tried too. Um, but uh, getting to the point, I had a little Bluetooth module lying around. I'm like, hmm, well I wonder if I can make this work really easily so, so I can send text commands and just address this thing directly. Um, and so I downloaded such and such app and I powered this thing up and I hooked up TX to RX just to make sure that I could echo characters through it. Freaking awesome, this works, right? So then, you gotta plug it in backwards. I'll plug that guy in and all of a sudden, I've got wireless connectivity with my phone. Now let me tell you about the, uh, the, the Bluetooth app or two, two of the apps that I found. The first one, or, or actually the one, the, the Bluetooth app that I did not use is called Senna B term. This is uh, this is actually a really cool application, and the reason it's really cool is because, um, and I, I didn't use it extensively, but it appears that it gives you direct terminal access 
to the Bluetooth module on your Android phone, which is freaking amazing to me that they would let you do this. It's an AT command set, right? So you can do a discovery, you can do automatic, or not automatic, it's a manual connect. Everything is manual. I love that because it gives you uh, a lot of ability to, you know, I'm, I'm tired of being connected now. Please don't make decisions for me. Just do what I'm telling you to do. And that's pretty cool. Um, it is not the one I went for. Uh, I can really see using this as a tool in the future, but it is not the one I went for for this application. So the one that I did use, is just called B T S P P Serial Port Protocol Bluetooth. Hey, um, so if you do a search for that on uh, the App Store or whatever the heck it's called, uh, you will come up with that thing. The reason I liked this one, um, it's 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 fairly intuitive to use. Uh, you can use it in um, like a command mode line or command line mode. Uh, you can also, uh, let's see, there's another one that they called, which I think is just called terminal, which seems obvious. Uh, and then there's uh, a keyboard mode. The keyboard mode is pretty cool because it gives you nine configurable buttons, right? I don't know how to program Java. I'm not going to make my own app. Um, this thing gives me nine buttons that I can configure, and it's, it's really, really easy. I did not read directions to do this. I just sort of followed the prompts, and it was done. And I configured four buttons to give me volume up, volume down, audio on, audio off. And it was really, really quick. Um, things I don't like about this thing, it doesn't let you disconnect manually which is really strange. It's like you can, you can turn the app off, but your Bluetooth stays connected, okay? So you've either got to shut off one end or the other to break the connection, or go into your phone settings and say, stop with the Bluetooth. You can't do it from the app. That seems really backwards to me. One thing I do like is that when you minimize the app, the Bluetooth stays connected, right? So I can, I can minimize that, shut off the phone, jam it in my pocket, walk around and do whatever I want in the garage, and at any time, pick up the phone, bring up the app, and adjust, and it's still connected, and it's virtually instantaneous. Um, and I really like that. Uh, however, if you walk farther, like too far, and it breaks the connection, there are times where it will not I mean, <laughs> the first time I used it, it was like, hey, do you want to reconnect to the last thing you were talking to? Yes, how convenient, how awesome is that? Um, and then a few times later, it failed to recognize that it was no longer connected, would not give me an option to reconnect, uh, and in, in no menu could I find any <laughs> way to reconnect the thing. Um, that particular time, I had to cycle power on my phone to get it to actually come back and talk to me, which was kind of irritating. Uh, I haven't had that happen again yet, um, so, so far so good, uh, but mostly it's the configurable buttons that make this thing really easy to use. Now, uh, I want to give you a demo of what I've done. So this is, this is a demo, this is my setup here. Uh, I got my audio coming from my uh, netbook. Uh, I connected power f uh, using these XT60 connectors that we have. Um, these are really cool. Um, they, they may not seem as polished as something like a Dean's connector, but for a cheap high current connector, these things are freaking awesome, man. That goes to here, speakers are wired up to the amp, I got the, the Bluetooth in, I've actually got my connection already going, and I'll turn on the music there, and I will start this out. Now you probably can't see this very well, but there's nine configurable buttons, four of which have been configured. So first I'll turn the audio on. All right, so just to prove functionality, and it happens pretty quick. I don't know, can you, can you hear that really well? Hear that? Okay, good. So there's off. Off sounds like off. On. Volume up. And I don't know, you probably can't see the faders move at all, but uh, they're moving just a hair. Volume down. Can turn the volume all the way down. Can turn the audio all the way off. Um, and there you are. This was really easy to do. All, all it took is one Bluetooth that plugged automatically into that board and this free app and I configured buttons and I didn't need the Google ADK, I didn't need a yo-yo, um, and I, I grant you it's not the prettiest interface but it is effective. You know, I can, I can minimize it like yay, shut the display off, throw it in my pocket, walk around and I'm cool. So let's talk about next steps. Um, 
Now I could, I could, uh, I could pursue the XB thing, and it would be pretty cool to have internet connectivity. Um, but, and this may be an erroneous assumption, but I think I'm probably going to be dealing with a little more latency. Um, uh, right? I can, I can hit the button on my phone, and this thing is like that. It's really quick. Uh, with internet connection, I imagine there's going to be some latency uh, involved, uh, and it's a lot more expensive of an option. However, once I have that backbone in place, I can connect to all kinds of things all over my house over XB and internet. Um, but for this purpose, I don't think I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to stick with the Bluetooth because it's really easy to use. Um, so the next step from here uh, is supposed to be a display, right? I wanted to do like VU meters and graphic demonstrations of this, that, and the other thing. Um, but honestly, you can't be very impressed that all I've done is make the volume go up and down and the audio turn on and off. That's not really that impressive, is it? So um, I think the next step is going to be to uh, integrate an MP3 player into this so that I have full control over all the music. If I, you know, a song comes up I don't like, I can skip it. So that's pretty cool. Um, well, it will be when I do it. So the question becomes, which MP3 player would I use? Would I use one of the ones we sell off the storefront? Probably not. Um, the reason is because um, they have restrictions, right? You, it's got to be, well, they do, I think they both do FAT32 now, but it was, there was like a FAT16 restriction at one point. Um, I'm not sure if the file names, they, all the files have to be like 192K bit files. Um, and uh, the code doesn't seem like it's really up to snuff. And I could work on a bunch of code, but for the money you'd have to spend for that thing, it'd be a lot easier just to buy something off of eBay, you know, tear it apart and make my own connections to the buttons and wire those straight up to this guy. I've got five more buttons I can configure on my uh, Bluetooth interface and it's a really simple matter to string those out to a logic line that throws a switch. So if I can get like, you know, start track, stop track, uh, advance or go back, I, I think that would probably be sufficient and that would give me enough control that I'd feel pretty good about it. So the next step is not going to be a display, it's going to be to integrate an MP3 player and probably one that I find on the street somewhere, something cheap. So that's it for the May edition of According to Pete. As always, leave comments and questions in the comment section below, or alternately, you can send an email off to feedback at sparkfun.com with According to Pete in the subject line. So thanks for uh, checking me out, and it out, and us out, and I will see you next month.